Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. This is the podcast that tackles tough questions about relationships, life, love, and loss. It may not be the advice you want, but it's probably the advice you need. And now here's your host, grief therapist, motivational speaker, relationship expert, best-selling author, and attorney, the not really mean, mean lady herself, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Nelly Talk Me Lady Talk and Podcast, and welcome back to episode 54. Now, in the last podcast, the reason that I was going on and on about people who've decided to take up breakup coaching without a clue about what they're talking about is because there are many people on the internet trying to convince other people, okay, this is how you make money. And they're talking them into all sorts of really stupid things. The population of people who are most vulnerable to suicide are people coming off a break. And I want to caution anybody who's either coming off a breakup or who's thinking about going into breakup coaching. You need to think about that. And if you're coming off a breakup and you're looking for a breakup coach, Look for someone who knows what the hell they're doing. Because there's just way too many people out there marketing things that they know nothing about. You know, a couple of years ago, was everybody build your email list, build your email list, build your email list. Then when you have thousands of people on your email list, you sell them anything. And then you get inundated with emails every single day. I have unsubscribed to more mailing list that I don't even remember getting on. And that's the reason why I don't send out my newsletter that often because I know that everybody else is getting it. The minute you go onto a website, it's like, oh, want to sign up for our mailing list? And yes, I have one of those on Getting Past Your Breakup, but I also have it on other passive places where if you want the newsletter here, go here and do it. I do put discounts in the newsletter that I don't put anywhere else. I do put announcements in the newsletter that I don't put anywhere else. But I'm not saying that so that you rush out and sign up for the newsletter and then I'm going to be in your mailbox every day. I have some people that for some reason I somehow got on their mailing list and now I get email every single day from them. And after a while, I'm like, okay, I got to unsubscribe to this. is I don't even know who these people are. I just see the names and I'm like, oh, my God. Like I have no idea. Is this a political person? Is this a psychology person? Is this a legal person? Who is this person? Oh, anyway. Okay, so. A woman came on the Facebook group and she said that some friends of hers thought that she would like to date this guy that they knew. And she said she really wasn't ready to date, but she thought that she would have a few conversations with him. And so they talked on the phone and she said that all he did was talk about himself. And I was very dismayed to see, and I understand that you ladies are just learning this stuff out of the gate. But there were way too many excuses for this guy. First of all, if somebody is talking only about themselves, it says one of three things. One, he's a narcissist. Two, he's unhealthy because it says in getting back out there, you want to ask questions about the other person because you want to know who they are. A healthy person wants to know who is this person that my friends are trying to set me up with. So. Either A, he's a narcissist, or B, he's not healthy. So those are not two good choices. So C, what is C? C is that he is a little boy who hasn't figured out that a man asks a woman, what's up with you? So he's one of those three things. There's nothing else. And the thing about maybe he was nervous, this is an eighth grade. This is 40s people getting together. If you start making excuses for somebody you don't even know out of the gate, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And then when I went in and said that, I noticed that the ladies ignored my advice and all talked back and forth about this like it was the most sensible thing. Ladies, no. The reason I found a guy who loved me like there was no tomorrow was because if I had met him that night and he only talked about himself, it would have been like, see ya. I mean, as soon as I walked up to him, I was like, what's your, what's your issue? What's your story? But I said to Michael, I saw him standing in a corner at a table eating potato chips all by himself. 
And he didn't look like the type of guy who was friends with the guy that I was friends with who, who owned the house. And I thought, did he just wander in off the street? Because we were in the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I was like, did he just wander in off the street and see like a bowl of potato chips sitting on a table in the front room and decide to help himself? I didn't know who he was. I mean, I was very late to the party. I'd gone to a concert at House of Blues. So I walk into the place and he's standing there like eating chips by himself. And I looked at him and I was like, who are you? And first of all, I didn't think that that was their spread because this was a gay couple and these were potato chips and and pretzels. And I was like, I expected a better spread than this. (laughs) And I said that. This is it? This is it? Potato chips and pretzels? Really? And then I made a few snarky comments about it. He was just like shrugging his shoulders, shoveling the potato chips in his mouth. And I was like, what's your deal? Like, who are you? And then he told me. And then his eyes just grew really wide. Like, what, is this woman going to attack me? I was a little bit forward. What are you doing? Who are you? What's going on here? And I don't remember how we rolled into a conversation, but we rolled into a conversation and it went back and forth. And he told me weeks later that he was nervous the first night he met. And that as we started talking, he said he really couldn't believe that he was feeling something that he couldn't believe that he was feeling. And we just got into this role with each other. But if he had started talking about himself and didn't ask me anything about myself, I wouldn't have gone out with him. And I certainly wouldn't have made excuses for that. Why in the world would you do that? You're going to sit there eight months from now and go, you know what? I was just in a relationship with a narcissist. I don't know how that happened. Do you know how that happened? It happened because the first night when all he did was talk about himself, you decided that maybe he was nervous. Maybe he was nervous. He's nervous. Ladies, we are not going to powder their butts and put on the diaper and stick a pacifier in their mouth and pat them on the head. If you want a baby, if you want a little boy, if you want a little toddler, if that's the standard that you want, that's what you're going to get. Or else you're going to get a raging narcissist who will say six months down the line, you knew what I was. The first night we met, all I did was talk about myself. What are you talking about? Or somebody who's ragingly unhealthy. Maybe he's not a narcissist. Maybe he's not quite that way. Maybe he's not that far into this personality disorder. But he's very unhealthy because healthy people ask, who are you? Am I interested in you? Do I care about you? Do I want to go out with you? Do I want to know you? That's what healthy people do. There is nothing good about someone doesn't ask about you. And if you're going to make excuses for someone, whether it's they're talking about themselves or they didn't do this or they didn't do that, you're going to be in a world of trouble. And a year down the line, you're going to be in another shitty relationship and you're going to say, how the hell did I get here? And I'll tell you how you got there. You got there because you made excuses about some guy you didn't even know. You didn't even think about it. You didn't think about, instead of think, maybe he's nervous, that's a maybe. And that's a who care. The definites are this. These are the things you can choose from. Either A, he's a narcissist, or B, he's unhealthy. Because narcissists don't ask you about you, and unhealthy people don't ask about you. And if he's a little boy who's nervous talking to a lady, do you want that? Are you serious? Somebody said to me, I was talking to a lady, and I just started rambling about myself. No, it's just so crazy. I just felt so nervous. I would be like, man up, dude. Grow up. Man up. Put big boy pants on. I would laugh myself off the couch if a friend of mine said that to me. I was talking to a woman and I was very nervous because I didn't know her. She wanted to text, but I didn't like to text. Because that was the other thing she said. She didn't like, he didn't like to text. He wanted to talk on the phone. So if I had a friend, if I had a guy friend, and he said, I met this woman, a friend of mine said that I would like this woman. She wanted to tax. I don't like to tax. I don't like to tax. I don't like to tax. So I was talking to her, and I would tell her all about me, and I would tell her about my ex, and I would tell her about my kids, I would tell her about this. And, you know, I forgot to ask her 
hurt because I was so nervous. I would say, what are you, 10? Are you 10? I'd say, dude, you're not ready for women. Nervous. Give me a solid, complete break. And when the person who has the standards and the boundaries and has waded through all the bullshit guys and recovered from all the bad relationships and found true love and a guy who adored her says, that's not the way you do it. You don't ignore her and then talk amongst yourselves like she didn't even talk. It's foolish to make excuses without even thinking about it. Because a 40-something-year-old guy who's too nervous, ridiculous. Do you, do you even think about that? I mean, suppose that was a thing. He's nervous. That's not an excuse. That's not a reason. Who wants a guy who's too nervous to ask about you? No, baby. Maybe he's nervous. He could be nervous like he's nervous. Don't talk to the mean lady. She's going to tell you that it's not okay for him to be nervous. Nervous. Oh, he's nervous. 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 Ladies, this is not the way we get healthy. This is not the way we get into good relationships by making excuses out of the gate that he's nervous. It's not funny. Saying something like he's nervous smacks of desperation. I don't care what kind of foolish, foolish shroud you want to put on that. It's desperate and it's crazy. And if you're going to sit there and say, oh, maybe he was nervous. You're just going into mommy mode and you're just going to have a big fat king baby. You're either going to have a king baby or an unhealthy, dysfunctional lunatic or a narcissist. Those are the choices you get when you start making excuses like hey, nervous out of the gate. It needs to stop and it needs to stop now. Thank you very much because this is how we get into crappy relationships and this is how we continue to do the same thing over and over and over. Don't do it. So this is kind of one of those hard as nails, mean lady talking, mean lady's really going to talk podcast. And bear with me because there is a lot of stuff here. And I hope that you don't just take it for listening pleasure and you listen to what I'm saying. And I'm not making fun of people. I am saying this and there's a whole bunch of things to think about. Okay, so then another thing that I want to say about that is that I didn't say this guy definitely was a narcissist. I said nothing about not ask about her bodes well. Any reason why is bad and it's not he's nerve even he's nervous is bad. It's a bad reason for him to not ask about her. The other one was maybe he's awkward. Some people are awkward. It's like 16 year old kids with pimples are awkward. A guy who's been married and has kids should not be awkward. Awkward is for 16 year olds and again if you're making excuses like this, this is why you wind up in shitty relationships months from now because you have no expectation of adult behavior from a person. If you're going to excuse the fact that they didn't ask word one about you, you're going to let a whole bunch of other stuff go. It's absolutely inexcusable. There's no excuse in the world for someone to not ask about you out of the gate. At the very least, it's rude. At the very most, it's narcissistic. And yes, many narcissists do the love bombing thing. They act like they're so into you and all they do is talk about you and ask about you. And what I would like to do is to roll into something that will explain just that. And what I'm about to say about my television actually has something to do with something that I'm about to say later on. So bear with me. My television does this thing. I don't know if it's Fios. It could be Verizon because I hate Verizon. I've got to get rid of Fios. They're doing this thing now where they're advertising all these shows that I don't want to see on my television. I'd rather the little bouncy Fios thing that used to be on. A lot more entertaining than seeing somebody Tiger's Neighborhood or some other thing. But it does this thing with certain shows where it just cuts them off. And I've tried to figure out, okay, I'll go into the DVR and I'll do 30 minutes at the beginning and 30 minutes at the end. And I still don't get it right. And there's only a few shows. It's Dateline, 
Good Eats Reloaded and Catfish. So, of course, I'm going to be talking about Catfish. Dayline is going to be for the true crime people. <laughs> Us true crime weirdos. And maybe one day I'll get into something like that. But for today, we're going to talk about Catfish. And I'm going to roll into the narcissist thing in a minute. So I'm watching this Catfish episode, and Catfish is one of these shows that I just can't get right on the DVR. It starts in the middle of one, so I kind of get the idea of what's going on. And then it starts in the next one. I've been trying to do some spring cleaning, even though I have pneumonia, and even though I'm trying to rest, I'm still trying to do some spring cleaning, because that's what I do at this time of year, because it's spring. So I was moving files around, not files on the computer, but actual physical files in my room. And so the next show started, and Neve and Max have been sitting in this cafe in Hartford, Connecticut, and this woman walked up, and she had the picture of this guy that was with Neve. Do you know this guy? And he's like, not really. I mean, obviously, they had met. And she said that he told her that he was the personal trainer. So the name of the episode, in case you're wondering, is Caitlin and Kent. So hold on to your hats. And so I was kind of across the room, and I was thinking, oh my goodness, this started in the middle. So I'm going to have to go on YouTube and see if the rest of this episode is on YouTube. Because if it's not, I'm not going to finish watching this. Because I'm never going to know what happened. But I didn't sprint across the room fast enough because A, I wasn't sprinting. And B, there was a whole bunch of crap in my way. And then she mentioned that she was from Worcester, Massachusetts. Which I don't know if you guys know that I lived in Massachusetts for 10 years. And I know Worcester very, very well. So... She says Worcester, Massachusetts, because they were in Hartford. And she says that she was like 30 minutes from there, which uh, she seemed like a nice woman. But of course, the guy's lying right out of the gate. He's not Neve's personal trainer. So they go to her house. And the thing that I really loved about this episode, and I kept watching it, even though I'm going, it's going to cut off at the end and I'm never going to know what happened. Anyway, I'm watching this and I knew exactly where they were almost at all times. I knew what hotel they were staying in. I could, I could tell by the scenery in the back of the hotel where they were staying. I could tell exactly where she lived. Not maybe not Maybe not the exact street but pretty damn close. And my son used to live right in that neighborhood. So I knew exactly where they were. And she had like this pretty horrific story. And she said that her parents had won a whole bunch of money at the casino and they moved from Massachusetts to Florida. And when she was 14 years old, she was raped by a family friend. And that is like one of the most traumatic things and such a a traumatic thing to happen at a traumatic age. And she started talking about this guy, Kenton, and saying that he was telling her that something similar had happened to him. And as soon as she said that, I thought about this because this is something that narcissists will do. And I've talked about this on other podcasts. They listen for you to say something. And I talked about this with the generosity because a lot of people who get take have this happen to them where they'll say, oh, you know, I'm a really generous person. And then the narcissist or the sociopath or whoever the hell it is, maybe it's just a very dysfunctional person says, oh, I'm a really, um, you know, I'm a really generous person too. And when you are a truly generous person and you're a truthful person and you're saying out loud, I'm a generous person, You're thinking if someone else says to you, I'm a generous person too, that A, they're telling the truth and B, they're generous. You know, so B, they're generous. This is how many times a narcissist, but most likely a sociopath, worms their way in. They do ask questions about you and they start to mirror you. It's called mirror in. And on this episode of Catfish, Max actually says he's mirroring her. And There's nothing in the episode that suggests that didn't happen to him, but it reminded me of the things that I've talked about. They see this other person as having told them that they're generous. They just take the information in as the truth because they've told the truth to them. Again, it's frame of reference. Your frame of reference is I'm a generous person. I tell the truth. So when somebody says to you, I'm a generous person, you just assume that they're telling the truth. So that's another thing to look out for. 
And when we're talking about first conversations, that's something to look for. That's one of the reasons why you want to hold really important information like how generous you are or having a traumatic event happen to you at an early age. You want to kind of hold that back because you don't want someone mirroring that to you. You don't want somebody to say, oh, I was raped too, because then you think that you have a connection and an understanding that you don't really have because maybe that really didn't happen to them. So one of the things that you can do to prevent that is to hold really personal issues like that until much later. And like I said, I talked about being in abusive relationships to Michael, but I didn't go into any details about abuse. I mean, early in my early divorce days, for a few years after my separation, I told every guy every gory detail about the abuse. It was terrible. I mean, I shouldn't have been telling them all that. I never told Michael all that. Never told Michael all that. I didn't tell Michael anything. I didn't give him any details. But anyway, to get back to Caitlin and Kenton. So the the episode goes on, but Kenton, all of a sudden, he's in Kentucky and he's been telling her things like, oh, other single ladies step up because she can't talk to him all day because cell phones are forbidden at work, which is a really good policy for a workplace to have. And she says, I have to put my cell phone in the locker. I can't text all day. And when I get home, I have a daughter and I have to deal with her. And he basically was gaslighting her by saying, oh, you know, other single mothers make more of an effort than you do. Kind of trying to prey on her insecurities and also being an asshole. That's an asshole thing to say. And if somebody says something like that to you, it's gaslighting. It's trying to make you bad guy when you're doing absolutely nothing wrong. And she got into this defensive mode with him. And I think part of the reason why he did get that far with her, because she knew on some level that the way he was acting was not okay. And Max was really bullshit about the whole thing. And since Max has left the show, Neves had some co-hosts that have been angry like Max used to get and call people out on things like Max always did. Machine Gun Kelly, I thought was going to kill somebody because they were basically playing a game just to get on television. But I thought Machine Gun Kelly was going to actually truly machine gun somebody on that episode. But anyway, Max was really angry when he heard about how Kenton was saying these things to So Kenton is gaslighting her and that's gaslighting when you're telling somebody, oh, you know, you're not really putting the effort in, you know, but it's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. But because of his simpatico thing about how he had been molested or something to that effect, you know, and who knows if it was true that never came out in the episode. She had this connection to him or she thought she had this connection to him. So she was very reluctant to let him go. But we've got the lie about how he's Neve's personal trainer and now this gaslighting bully thing that he's doing to her about not putting in the effort. So they're going over to her house to try to explain to her that what they found out about him and they think that he is who he says he is, which is kind of rare on Catfish. And then all of a sudden he calls them because they had called these other women that he had been involved with. And of course, there's all these overlapping relationships. And Max is totally over this guy. Eve always gives him the benefit of the doubt, which is how he won- probably wound up catfished in the first place, which is how this whole thing started. But Max is totally over this guy. You could tell I pissed at him. Well, anyway, Kenton is in Kentucky. He wants Caitlin to move out there with her daughter. And... And he calls, and first of all, there's this woman on YouTube named Ashley Miller, and I, the only thing that I watched was her review of this episode, because I was looking for, and this is how this stupid DVR thing comes into play, found my way to my computer at some point during this episode. I had logged into YouTube, because now it's not just about 
Worcester and looking at Worcester and seeing all these places that I absolutely know where they are and what they're doing and stuff like that. But now I'm really into the story. I want to know what's going to happen. And so I had pulled up anything on this episode and I put in Kate Lennington and I saw this woman named Ashley Miller and here's a shout out to Ashley. <laughs> She's probably never heard of me and has no idea what's going on. But the reason that I'm bringing her up is because Henton calls Neiman Max, which no catfish ever does. Catfish never calls Neiman Max. Not only did he call Neiman Max, but he's on a plane going to Massachusetts. And this comes out later on in the show, but if he could just hop on a plane to go to Neven Max because he heard that they were sniffing around about it and he had to get there and tell his side of the story, why couldn't he have jumped on a plane and gone to see Caitlin? Why? Why was he pressuring her, pushing her to move her and her daughter out there and he couldn't go visit her, but all of a sudden, Neva Max is there, and now he's jumping on a plane. So anyway, Ashley Miller says, and this is what I thought was pretty funny, she says the minute she hears his voice, she's like, oh my God, like he does. He's, I had the exact same reaction that she had to his voice, was, oh my God, what a horrible voice. And Caitlin was saying that, or one of the other women that Neva Max had talked to about him was saying, yeah, all these women were falling all over him. And I was like, who the hell could be falling all over him with a voice like that? It was a totally horrible voice. So I wanted to give a shout out to Ashley Miller because I was like, almost all of her reactions to him, I had the exact same ones. She was talking about working out and she noticed, and I noticed this one point in the episode where he's sitting there with his little pouty arms crossed and she was saying that she's working out and she's working on, on getting into shape and stuff like that. And she's like, he has the same flaps that I have. I was like, I love her. So anyway, that's why I'm giving her a shout out because it was really funny. But anyway, for some reason, my television did not cut off the end of the episode. I actually was able to see the end of the episode, but I was really glad to have found Ashley's take on the episode because I thought I was being real snarky about his voice, but it was like really horrible. But anyway, they get there and they meet him at this coffee shop and he's this pouty little boy. He won't even look at her, and he tells even Max that he thinks she's lying about not having time. And, you, like, I can see Max's eyes are, like, popping out of his head, and I, I'm surprised Max didn't hit him, because Max actually looked like he wanted to hit him. The guy was just so despicable. So, he's this pouty little boy. He was pressuring this woman, and this is what they do. And they find the weakness, they find the insecurity, but they also do this thing where they kind of give you the impression that you have a connection about some very special thing. And in their case, it was supposed to be a traumatic assault. And again, I have no idea if an assault actually happened or not. But what I do know is that he's a grade A King baby sitting on a throne. And you ladies know that that is a term that I use quite often. And Kenton, if you're out there, you are a king baby sitting on a throne. Your voice is horrible. And you are not in very good shape because like Ashley Miller said, I saw the flab on your arm. You're a pouty little king baby. And the only reason you flew out there was because you wanted your 15 minutes of fame on Catfish and you got it, but you look like a total dick, a total, total dick. If there's a woman in Kentucky, and I guess this other woman met him in Cincinnati. So if there's any woman anywhere, Kentucky or Ohio or any place else, stay away from Kent, big king baby. And he lies about things. So the other thing is, This is what they do. My ex-husband was one of the biggest liars on the face of the earth, and he accused everyone else of lying. He accused my oldest son of lying so many times that I swear the kids started lying. And I told my husband that was going to happen. When we were married, I said, 
You know, when my parents didn't believe me when I was telling the truth, I started lying to them because I'm like, I'm going to be blamed for lying anyway. The more I got in trouble for things I didn't do, the more I did things that, well, I'm going to get in trouble anyway, might as well do something. And I told my first husband, I said, you keep calling that kid a liar. And he was calling him a liar. He was like three, four years old. Oh, you're lying. You're lying. Three or four year olds don't even know what lying is. But my son lied so much, he had no idea. But when he was a kid, he started lying about absolutely everything. And I kept telling my husband, because again, it's frame of reference. If you're a liar, you accuse everyone else of lying. So what happens with this guy? He's telling Neve, oh yeah, I, it was a little white lie that I knew you. A little white lie that I knew you? I mean, that's a big lie. So he minimized what he did, and then he just assumed she was lying. He goes, oh, she's lying about not being able to call him during the day or text him during the day. And that's what people do. And they put you on the defensive because that's what my ex used to do to me. I don't think he ever called me a liar, but he would accuse me of things I wasn't doing. He would tell me I was thinking things I wasn't thinking. He would tell me I was feeling things I wasn't feeling. I was always defending myself. But he always accused the kids of lying, always accused the kids of lying. And other people, well, everybody was lying. And that's what this guy Kenton did. It was like, he's like, oh, she's lying, she's lying. How can you call somebody a liar? And if you think she's a liar, why are you pressuring her to go and live with you? And like Ashley Miller said, thank God she didn't go out there. He would have been abusive to her and to her daughter. And Ashley Miller thought that Kenton might be a woman beater, and I wouldn't go that far because I don't know the guy, but it would be bad. That's abusive. Call someone a liar. It's bad. It's really bad. So that's King Baby sitting on a throne. Now, one of the things to take from that episode is the mirroring. The reason why they got close and the reason why she had trouble letting him go, even though he was being a real asshole to her because he kept badgering her about not giving him enough time and saying, you know, other single moms, you know, find time or better than you, you need to step up, you know, blah, blah, blah. What a bunch of bullshit. You know, if somebody is doing that to you, just let them go because that kind of stuff is going to last longer than any kind of connection that you have. I mean, a connection is, okay, We understand each other. I mean, Michael and I had that. We both had the black sheep mentality. I was the black sheep of my family. He was the black sheep of his family. That connection was something that was just part of who we were. If he turned into an asshole, that connection wasn't worth a thing. So anyway, yes, sometimes when you have a narcissist, they can love bomb you. They can ask you a lot of questions. Because they want to mirror, and this is more sociopath than narcissist. And I don't know if Kenton's a sociopath, but if you're an ex of Kenton's, please call me and let me know. <laughs> but sociopaths will listen and they'll mirror you and they'll try to get those inroads. But they're asking about you because they're taking notes on what things they can mirror back to you and set up a false connection because the connection will only exist in your mind. And then they'll get away with bullshit like Kenton got away with Caitlin because you think you have this unique connection. So yes, narcissists will ask about you and they will kind of dig into it. So not asking about you doesn't necessarily mean that they're a narcissist, but not asking about you is not a good thing. Because asking about you could be either he's a good guy or he's polite or he's this or he's that. It could mean that he's a narcissist. But if he doesn't ask about you, there's nothing that it could mean that's any good. Nothing, 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 nothing. So yes, there are narcissists who will love bomb you and there are narcissists who will ask about you because they're taking notes and they want to mirror back to you so that they can get you in their grip. But that still doesn't mean that the guy that doesn't ask about you is worth anything because he's not. Oh, so ladies, thank you so much. And guys, let's be careful out there too. Ashley Miller, I'm going to watch some of your other shows one of these days, but that one was hilarious. Thanks so much for 
making that. And yeah, Kenton's voice was just like a total no. So, and everything else you said about him, I totally agree with all of it. Every single word. So thank you very much. Talk to you later. Take care. This is Susan Elliott, Me Lady Talk Podcast. And let's be careful about this. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.